Well, it's amazing to see everybody here. <laughs> it's so fun to have the whole church all together. Uh, what a glorious uh, time that we have to be able to do that. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open up to the book of Proverbs. That's where we're going to be at this morning, looking at the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 through 8, specifically is what we'll be looking at. And today, as we start a, a new series uh, in wisdom literature for the summer, and we're going to hear uh, various sermons through the book of Psalms and Ecclesiastes, but today, this morning, I want to start us off in the book of Proverbs. And we're going to look at some of the most foundational principles to living a life of blessing and wisdom. And who doesn't want to live a life of blessing and wisdom? Of course, all of us do. And so what is the path for that? That's what the book of Proverbs focuses on. The book of Proverbs was written to, uh, by Solomon, by King Solomon, to his son Rehoboam with the goal of passing along the most important principles of living a life that God blesses. He, he, Rehoboam was going to become king, and Solomon wanted to equip him for that purpose. But the book of Proverbs is not just written for Rehoboam, it's written for us as well, that we would know these principles of wisdom. And so this morning, I want to look at a passage that is probably very familiar to most of us. But I want to look at this particular passage because I think it is so foundational to living a life of wisdom and blessing. If we can get these two things right, so much else in our life will fall into place. But if we get these things wrong, the consequences of that are disastrous. And so take a look with me at Proverbs chapter 3 as we read the word of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil, and it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we come to your word, Lord, we receive this word as absolute authoritative truth. We receive this word as your word. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take our minds and you would renew them by the power of your word. We pray that your spirit would dig deep into our lives and our hearts this morning, exposing things in our lives that need to be transformed and changed by your grace. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to respond in obedience to your word. We know that we cannot do it in our own strength. We need your spirit to empower us for that. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this particular ver these particular verses we're looking at, Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, they're found in a larger section of the book of Proverbs in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And in that particular section, Solomon is laying out for his son what will lead to a life of blessing. And in this section, he, he, he presents a number of requirements or commands, and then he follows them up with rewards or blessings. You'll notice that. If you look at verses 1 through 12, you'll see these couplets where he gives a command or a, a requirement, and then where he gives a reward or you could say a blessing. In, in verses 1 through 2, he calls his son to remember God's word, and the reward will be life and peace. In verses 3 and 4, he calls his son to live according to steadfast love and faithfulness, and the reward will be they will bring favor in God's sight. Here in verses 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, the father instructs his son with two very clear commands, two very clear requirements. In verses 5 through 6, he calls his son to trust the Lord. And in verses 7 through 8, he calls his son to fear the Lord. 
And the rewards of that trust and that fear will be a blessed life. And so first, we see the command to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. Now the word trust means to rely upon, to put your confidence in something, to believe to the point of of, of reliance, of actually trusting on something. If you've ever gone rock climbing, you know how, how concerning that can be when you begin to start climbing and the higher you get, the more fear can build in your life. And so to help that, oftentimes those that are leading you on, on those rock climbing expeditions, they'll have you climb a few feet up and then let go of the rocks. <laughs> and when they tell you to let go of the rocks, you're like, uh, are you sure? Now, you, you're willing to do it because you're only a couple feet off the ground. But when you let go of the rock, you realize that all the gear that you're wearing and the people that are holding those ropes, that they have got you. And they want you to be confident in that gear so that as you climb the rest of the mountain, when you get 50 feet up and you are scared to death if you are going to fall, you realize that if you were to fall, you would be safe. That same carabiner that held you at 3 feet will hold you at 50 feet. There's no difference. That same person belaying you has got you. That's the idea of trust. That's the root of this idea. It's a sense of being safe and secure. It's familiar somewhat to the idea of faith, but the word trust is more centered on our heart and our emotions, where maybe faith is more centered on our thinking and our intellect. Trust is a heart issue. And Solomon tells his son, there is only one thing you can trust. There is only one thing that will hold you and keep you safe. And that is the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord. The word Lord there in your Bibles is probably all capital letters. That represents in the Old Testament the covenant name of God, Yahweh. The name he gave to his people to express his covenant faithful love. Every time they heard that name, they were reminded that he was the God who rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. Every time they heard that name, they were reminded that he was the God who provided for them in the wilderness. And every time they heard that name, they were reminded that they were to follow that God obediently because he had demonstrated himself to be faithful. Much like the name Christ to you and, to, to you and me reflects so much. It reminds us that we were once in slavery and in death and in sin, but Christ rescued us. Christ redeemed us. That word, that name, reminds us that we are loved and that we are safe. Friends, this is the one that we are called to trust. And then Solomon go, continues on to describe some elements of this trust. And the first is, he describes the totality of trust. The totality of trust. He wants him to trust the Lord, but he, he gives him a specific instruction. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. The word heart in the Hebrew is not the pumping organ in the middle of your body. It reflects your innermost being. It reflects you. Not your flesh and bones, but you. Your soul, your spirit, your mind, your thinking, all of you. And Solomon is saying you need to trust God with everything. 
And I want you to think about that this morning. Are there areas of your life that you have yet to give over to Christ's control? Oh, I think we like to compartmentalize our lives. We like to think I will trust God with my salvation. But will I trust God with my finances? Will I trust God with my relationships? Will I trust God with my pain and suffering? What area in your life, in my life, Does the Spirit of God need to reveal to us that we are struggling to trust God in? What are we being tempted to rely upon other than God? You see, what Solomon is trying to help prepare his son for is that there will be things that feel like they're more real to you than God, but they're not. There will be things that that call for your trust, but do not believe the lie. Those things will fail you, but God will never fail you. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. What areas of God's Word are you struggling to believe? You see, I think oftentimes we call it faith when we believe the parts of God's Word that we want to believe. But the reality is that we have to believe all of God's word. And as our culture becomes farther and farther and farther away from the word of God, our faith, our trust, our confidence is tested. Do we believe God's word on everything above everything? Do we believe that God was good and perfect when he created gender, and sexuality, and explained in his word how that was to be lived out. What areas do we struggle to believe? You know, when we struggle to believe, Solomon was calling his son to remember who God was. And I think for us, we have an even greater, a greater uh, picture for us of why we would put our confidence in God. It's because of the love of Jesus Christ. Has Christ not demonstrated His love for us through the cross? Has He not given us everything? Why then would we not give Him our everything? If He has given us His all, why do we struggle to give Him our all. Remind yourself of what Christ has done. It will grow your trust. The second thing we see here is the barrier to trust. The barrier to trust. He calls his son to not lean on his own understanding. Do not. (laughs) It's kind of a warning here that he issues. Do not lean on your own understanding. Son, this will destroy your trust in God. To lean on is just a a synonym for trust. It's literally, the Hebrew word here was was like a crutch that somebody would, would put their full body weight on to hold them up. But figuratively, it it, it became uh, known as confidence, to put your confidence in something. And it's a, a synonym for the idea of trust. Don't trust your own understanding. The word understanding is the idea of discernment. It's the idea of of looking at something and determining whether it's good or bad. Whether it's right or wrong. The idea of, of determining how you think the world should operate. Your view of what is wise and good. The writer warns him, do not trust in your own understanding. And yet the world would tell us all the time, do exactly that. Follow your heart. You know, follow your heart. Do what 
feels right, what feels good. Solomon would say the absolute opposite of that. Do not follow your heart. (laughs) Do not lean on your own understanding. It will lead you to foolishness. We used to take a number of kids down to Mexico every year for uh, mission trips. And on one of those trips, we had a especially uh, cocky young man. Uh, let's say humility was not his strength. He was an athlete. He was strong and big and very popular. And when we were out to eat at a, at a restaurant towards the end of our trip, um, there were some peppers that were on the table of uh, where we were eating. And this young man was very confident that he knew how to eat hot things. But he had come from Washington. He had never been in Mexico. And the waiter who lived in Mexico warned this young man, do not touch those peppers. They are only for looks. They're for display. Even the locals do not eat those peppers. But this young man thought he knew in his own mind his ability and capabilities. And when he took a bite of those peppers to demonstrate his strength and his ability, his lips instantly blistered. He grabbed the nearest thing he could find and shoved it on his face and it did nothing to take away the pain. They poured milk on him. They put ice on him. Nothing would stop his suffering. His lips blistered and cracked, and we almost had to go to the emergency room because of his suffering and pain. Because he did not listen to the one who was wise, he trusted in his own understanding. You see, this is the consequence and the foolishness of believing that we know better than the one who knows everything. The one who is sovereign and good and in control. Why would we think that we know better how the world should work than the very one who created all things? And yet that's exactly what happens when we ignore God's word. When we toss it to the side. And friends, to do that, the consequences are much more severe than just a foolish young man. They are sometimes eternal. Do not follow your own emotions. That's the warning that Solomon is giving here. Do not be led by feelings. Do not be led by emotions. Sometimes your feelings will conflict with God's word. What will you do? Many times I sit down with people and counsel them and they say, Well, I feel like God's telling me to do this. And I say, well, if it's against God's word, that is not God. God is not going to call you to do something that he forbids in his word. And yet we we live in a culture where we are directed by feelings. How I feel about something. Solomon is telling his son, let the word of God lead you regardless of how you feel about something. Don't you know the scriptures tell us what our natural heart is like? In Proverbs 14, 12, the proverb says, there is a way that seems right to man. It feels right, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And we could go on and on and on. The scriptures are filled with warnings to not follow your heart, but to be renewed in your mind by the word of God. That's what Solomon is saying. Do not lean on your own understanding. And so, friends, where are you ignoring God's word because it doesn't match up with how you feel about something? Where are you being tempted to 
rely uh, on something else in place of God because that something feels more tangible to you. It, it feels more real to you. I think one of the struggles of trust and faith is that it requires us to believe in God that we can't see or tangibly experience. We can only know Him through His Word and by His Son. And so sometimes we're tempted to rely on things that feel more physical and present. Don't be deceived. Speak truth to your heart over and over again in the Word of God, through the Word of God. Renew your mind. Tell yourself what is truth until your feelings match up with truth. Make your heart believe so that your life is not led to destruction. And that really is the final piece of trust that Solomon wants to explain to his son, and that is the way of trust. The way of trust. How do we grow in this confidence, this trust? Well, he says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. The word way, very common in Hebrew Old Testament, especially in poetry, it speaks to the path of your life. If you were to walk to get water every day, you would develop a path going back and forth. You would cut a trail. That's the idea of this word. It is the conduct of your life. It is how you order your life, the way that you direct your life. And so it could be, uh, you could put the idea of, of the manner of your life in here or the way of your life. In all of the ways of your life, acknowledge Him. Now, this word acknowledge it's kind of uh, it's kind of a bummer that translators have continued to use the word acknowledge over and over again because I think in our English that word has changed to kind of just mean like a casual uh, recognition of right like when you see two guys kind of acknowledge each other like hey what's up what's up what's up right acknowledge that's not the word here the I, the the word here is to know. And if you know anything about Hebrew, that word has a, a variety of meanings, but it, it can go all the way to marital intimacy knowledge, to know one another. There is a depth of relationship. There is an emotional connection. This is not just intellectual. This is relational and experiential. It is to know someone. This is what we are called to do with the Lord. We are called to know him how do we build trust how do you build trust in any relationship how do you build trust in your marriage it is through time spent with a person getting to know that person allowing experiences to demonstrate the reality of trust the same idea is what solomon is calling us to his son to you must know god you must spend time with God. You must test God's truth in your life. Believe it, act upon it, and watch Him be faithful. The way of building trust in God is to know more and more His character and allow that knowledge of who He is to renew your mind and strengthen you in temptation. It is to trust God with all of your life to know that he can be trusted because of who he is so how are you spending time getting to know your savior are you prioritizing time with god this might seem like the most simple thing and the most simple application but it's actually the the most vital to a life of wisdom for most Christians, many times, the only exposure they have to the Word of God is a Sunday morning or at a Bible study, and the Word of God sits idle at home. They do not teach their family, their children. They do not meditate on the Word of God themselves. Friends, that is a life that is bound for suffering and foolishness. The life of blessing and wisdom is a life that is found 
in and through the word of God. How do you need to change your priorities? How do you need to alter your time and how you spend it? Nothing will happen if you don't change something. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. If you want to know God, you have to. There is no other way. You have to spend time with the Lord. You have to spend time in His Word. You have to spend time in prayer. You have to prioritize knowing who He is. And so, do you spend time knowing God? How can we possibly trust somebody that we do not know? And if we will trust the Lord, He promises a reward or a blessing that will come. He says, if you do this, this will be the result. And what is the blessing? It is that he will make your, make straight your paths. He will make straight your paths or make smooth. You could translate the word in that way as well. To make straight means that he will go in front of you and he will remove all of the obstacles in your way. It's a Hebrew way of saying, an illustration of, of saying that God will bless your life. He will make your straights smooth with less rocks in the way, with less obstacles in the way. He's promising a more blessed life. And who doesn't long for that? And this is a real promise. It doesn't mean that you'll never suffer. It doesn't mean that you'll never experience pain. But it does mean that a life of wisdom, according to God's word, will generally have less suffering from sinful decisions and sinful choices. Much of the pain and suffering that we experience is of our own making and of our own doing. And the promise here is that if we will walk according to God's word, if we will uh, walk according to wisdom, we will experience a more blessed life. You know, many of the things that uh, are consequences of the results of sin, we cannot we don't have to have that same kind of fear. You know, if you live according to God's word, if you live and you uh, exp- and alcohol for you is in moderation, uh, you probably will not find yourself wrapped around a telephone pole. If you live a monogamous relationship with one spouse and, or you are celibate outside of marriage, you do not need to worry about all of the diseases that everybody else is terrified of. There is wisdom in living according to God's word. That doesn't mean that we'll never suffer. It's not like the prosperity gospel that says, hey, if you have enough faith, you'll never experience pain and suffering. That's not what Solomon is saying. He's saying if you live according to wisdom, it will go better for you than if you don't. But suffering is part of the world. Jesus suffered. The disciples suffered. And the reality is that you and I will suffer. Then how is it that this promise can actually be 100% true that if we trust in the Lord, He will remove all obstacles? Well, it's because this promise is ultimately a promise that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This promise is, yes, true for the now, but it is ultimately true for eternity if you will trust in the lord with all of your heart christ will one day make you upright christ will one day remove all sin and all suffering in revelation 21 3 through 4 john says i heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the dwelling place of god is with man he will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You want to know how this promise can be fulfilled? It is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If you will trust in the Lord, One day, 
he will make all things new again. And so, friends, in an audience this size, I have to ask, have you personally trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Have you called out to him, recognized your, your need for him, acknowledged that you are a sinner who, have re, who has rebelled against God, believed that Jesus Christ died in your place, believed that he rose from the grave, and put your faith in him? If you have, you can know this promise is true. Trust in the Lord, and one day you will be in glory with God. If you have not done that, I want you to know that that's why we exist as a church. It is to help people know who Jesus is. And if you want to talk to somebody, I'll be around afterwards. I would be happy to talk to you. We have others that will be here every week to talk with you. Maybe somebody invited you this Sunday. They would love to talk to you. Whatever you are trusting in other than God will ultimately lead to a life of destruction. But trust in the Lord with all your heart, and He will rescue and save you. That's the promise that we see. And obedience is the result of that trusting. So let me ask you, friends that have trusted in Christ, are you daily trusting in Christ? Does trust reflect your faith and obedience. Because if we are trusting in Christ, it's not just an intellectual thing. It will come out in our life. It will be reflected in our time. It will be reflected in our obedience. And obedience is where uh, Solomon takes us next in the path of wisdom in verses 7 and 8. Not only do you need to trust the Lord, but you need to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Now, that word fear may make you think you need to run and hide. And the reality is if we ever saw God's presence, we would do exactly that. But the Hebrew idea is more of an idea of reverence. It's an idea of of honor. We see in verse 7, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. All of these are different ways of saying the same thing, right? To live in the fear of the Lord is to not be wise in your own eyes. It is to turn away from evil. And so there are three ways here that we demonstrate a proper fear of the Lord. The first is that we live humbly. We live humbly. Do not be wise in your own eyes. The word wise here, again, is the idea of discernment. The idea of, 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 of uh, to, to uh, discern or understand something. And so uh, Solomon is saying again, don't think that you have it all figured out. Don't be wise in your own eyes, according to your own standards, according to your own wisdom. You see, pride says, I know what is best. Humility says, God knows what is best. But the consequences of ignoring God's word, as we heard before, are are horrific. They are significant. At best, we will experience just pain and suffering in this life uh, as we reject God and rebel his word. But, But ultimately, if we continue on that path, the word of God says we will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Pride is one of the most dangerous sins in our life. It's also one of the most subtle and one of the most ignored. But pride, as we know, if you look at Scripture, is the root of all other sin. Pride says, I know better than God. I am going to live according to my standards, not His. Just like Adam and Eve, just like Lucifer When we follow pride, we follow their path. That's why the call to humility is repeatedly found throughout Scripture. Humility reflects Christ. Pride reflects our enemy. 
Philippians 2, 3-8, Paul encourages the church of Philippi, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each look not to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, when we walk in humility, we walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so pride is an area that we constantly need to be evaluating in our lives. Where am I growing in pridefulness? Maybe it's in, in ignoring God's word. That's pride. When we ignore God's word, when we say, I don't need it, when we put prayer to the side and say, I don't really need prayer. I can figure things out on my own. That is pride. Oftentimes it's reflected in our culture of just living for self, living for recreation, living for entertainment, living for the next thing, rather than, as Paul says here, looking out for the interests of others. Maybe it's rejecting authority that God's placed over your life. Spiritual leaders even. That's pride. There are multiple ways that we exhibit pride in our lives. And the warning of Solomon here is do not be wise in your own eyes. The second thing is to live reverently. Live humbly, live reverently. It's found in that word, fear. Fear the Lord. The word fear means to revere. It means to respect. And how do you know if you actually fear the Lord? What's a litmus test to say, do I fear the Lord? Well, it's obedience. Do you obey the Lord? If you do not obey the Lord, you do not fear the Lord. If you obey the Lord, if you believe His Word and walk in obedience to His Word, that is evidence that you have a right, proper understanding of who God is. You fear the Lord. I think the simplest definition of fear is that you would love what God loves and you would hate what God hates. This is how we would continually want to grow in our lives. Am I more and more loving what God loves and hating what God hates? This is fear. This is wisdom. Proverbs 1.7 1, tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The heart of all right living, the heart of all wisdom, is a proper view of God, is reverence for God. The reality is that if God, if, if, if he showed himself right now, there would be no question, there would be no questions asked. Do we, do we need to try to fear God? No. We would all fall on our faces as dead people. That's what happens every time in the scriptures, right? Whether it's the disciples, whether it's John with Jesus in the book of Revelation, whether it's Isaiah, every person who sees God's glory falls on their face like a dead person. That's what, how we would respond to the glory of God. But if you want to rightly fear God, you have to know God. You see, the more you know God, the more you know His character, the more you know His holiness, the more you know His awesome power, the more you know His justice, the more you will rightly revere God. Part of the reason why our current evangelical culture shows so, such a lack of reverence and fear of God is because we spend so much time preaching about us. What will make you happy? What, what will bring you more confidence? What will bring you more, more joy in your life? We are so you-focused that we have lost reverence for God. 
If you want to grow in reverence, grow in knowledge. Understand how holy He is. And understand how merciful He is. The more you dig into the Scriptures, the more you will begin to see God's awesome power and His holiness, but you will also see His awesome mercy. And both of those will cause you to worship. And so again, I ask you, how are you renewing your mind daily? How are you knowing God? How are you spending time understanding His character so that you will grow in reverence and fear of the Lord? The final encouragement here is how we live in fear of the Lord, and that is live obediently. Live obediently. You see it in the text there as he says, turn away from evil. Live humbly, live reverently, live obediently. The word turn away in the Hebrew means to remove, but it's also stronger. It is to abolish, it is to cut off, it is to forsake. That is how we are to respond to evil. This is a a junk term drawer, meaning it covers a whole range of things. It's talking about moral wickedness, or we would call it sin. Anything that is a rebellion against God's truth and word, his character, is evil. And we as followers of God, we are to remove these things from our life. And so the question is, for, for me and for you, is are we taking sin seriously in our lives. Jesus took sin as seriously as you can. In Matthew 18, 8 through 9, he says words that sometimes we wish we could just take out of the Bible and remove them because they're hard. Jesus says in Matthew 18, if your hand causes you or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now obviously, I don't think that this is to be taken literally in the sense of actually gouging your eye out. But Jesus could not be more strong in saying, you and I need to do whatever it takes to fight sin in our lives. It will not come by passivity. It will not come by us just ignoring sin. We must address it, and we must take radical steps by the power of God, to fight it. And if, if that is not strong enough, that Jesus says these words, what, what shows us that Christ takes sin even more seriously is that He chose to die on the cross so that we would not have to face the penalty that sin deserves. Christ knew the penalty of sin. He knew the consequences of sin. And to remove those from you and from me, He chose to take them upon Himself, both in the physical crucifixion and in the wrath of God that was poured out on the cross. Could there be a more powerful expression to us of the seriousness of sin? And yet, Far too often, we look at the grace of Jesus and we take our sin lightly. We say, there are people who actually say, Christ will forgive me, so why can't I just go live the way I want? What a mockery of the cross that is. What a rejection of God's actual mercy and grace to cheapen it and to say it means nothing. If you are in Christ, that should never be our attitudes. Our attitudes should be, why would I choose to live for that which Christ died for? 
Why would I choose to be entertained by that which Christ died for? Why would I choose to speak the words that Christ died for? And we are all going to struggle with sin. That is a reality. But that doesn't mean we have to treat it lightly. That doesn't mean that we don't fight it with everything we have. We are called as followers of Jesus to fight. Far too often, we treat sin like the fools that you find on TV who have a pet tiger. You ever seen those guys? They, they like take this little tiger home with them, and they treat it like a pet, like a little kitty. And when it's small and little, they can kind of do that. But you always read in the news, there's some moron who has, a, who has a wild animal as a pet and who dies from that wild animal. And you go, guess what? Duh. Tigers are not pets. They eat you. Friends, sin is not a pet. It will eat you. Do not treat it lightly. Do not think that that little sin that you feel like you have some control over now is light or small. It will continue to grow and it will destroy. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, Peter says, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. He is seeking someone to devour. Resist him. That sin that is growing in your marriage, if it is not dealt with, could lead to the destruction of your marriage. That sin that is growing on your computer, if it is not dealt with, could lead to a lifelong addiction. Do not treat sin lightly. Put it to death. Put it to death. That starts by renewing your mind. Renew your mind in the truth every day so that you would be strengthened. Put on the full armor of God so that you would be able to stand firm against the schemes of the enemy. But it also includes sharing your struggle with someone else who can help. Talking to a a Christian friend who can hold you accountable, who can walk with you, who can encourage you. If you don't have that, there are counselors here at Grace that would be happy to walk with you, happy to encourage you, strengthen you, and help you. But do not treat sin lightly. I know it's scary. I know it's hard to admit and acknowledge weaknesses and sin in our lives. But the consequences of hidden sin that is unaddressed are far, far worse. Ask God for strength. And courage, repent, and share with someone that you can be strengthened and walk in light. And so, what sin are you taking seriously in your life right now? We cannot take sin lightly if we want to walk in wisdom. And so, are you willing to start putting to death sin? That is the path to wisdom. So the requirement of wisdom is to fear the Lord. What then is the reward? Well, look at verse 8. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Solomon is simply using two words there to describe all of you, your flesh and your bones, that you will receive healing and refreshment. And again, there is a now component to this. If you live in obedience to God's word, reverence for the Lord, you will not face the kind of suffering consequences that come from sinful choices. And the more we sin, the more we will feel death upon our lives. You want to feel freedom from that? Walk in repentance. Walk in holiness. You will experience the refreshment that God has for you. But this promise is so much greater than just now. This promise is eternal. This promise is that one day, 
that if we walk in the fear of the Lord, putting our hope and trust in Jesus Christ, ultimately, all of the promises of Christ will be fulfilled in Christ. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst again. This is the promise of not just temporal healing, like the health and wealth gospel. This is not just a promise of temporal refreshment. This is the promise of eternal life with God. This is the promise of Christ. That is the promise of those who fear the Lord, of those who trust the Lord in Christ. We will get all of the riches of Christ. And it will not always be easy, but it will always be worth it. So friends, I want to encourage you as I encourage my own heart. Choose the path of wisdom. Choose to trust the Lord and choose to fear the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we come to a very familiar passage to many of us. Lord, I pray that we would not receive it lightly, but I pray that we would meditate on these truths. And we would ask you, Lord, show us where I am failing to trust you. Show us, Lord, what else I have placed in my life over you. Help me by your spirit to remove those things, to repent, and to walk in wisdom. And Father, we pray, God, that you'd help us, that we would live humbly and and reverently and obediently in Christ. And Lord, we know we can't do that apart from your spirit and your strength. And so, God, we ask you to strengthen us now. Help us. As we learn through the book of Jude that that we would keep ourselves in the love of the Lord as you keep us by your very power. We pray that you would help us to walk in wisdom. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.